Welcome to The Extra Dimension. This episode is a series of conversations from NerdCon Stories 2016. I am your host, Ian Arbuck. Now, this episode is a companion episode to the previous one, so this is The Extra Dimension number 19. Uh, it goes along with The Extra Dimension number 18. Uh, number 18 was a bunch of conversations that I was having with participants at NerdCon about NerdCon. And this episode is the parts of the conversations that didn't fit with that topic, but were really cool and fascinating nonetheless. So in this episode, you will be hearing some discussions surrounding game design, technical issues facing podcasting, a deep dive into Renaissance festivals, uh, discussions on several different uh, podcasts, and some video games and TV shows that uh, the people I was talking to were interested in. The show notes for this episode at thenexus.tv slash TED19 include a bunch of links to things that we are talking about in the episode, so definitely go and check that out if you are interested in any of these things. First up, I talked to Thad Fediplace about game design and how that brings in several different disciplines together uh, and how we can use that in education. With your teaching, like, like what, what uh, age groups, what kind of topics? Uh, high I'm school, um, mm-hmm. so nine, all 9 through 12, um, sure. and computer tech. Oh, fun. Um, so okay. I've, got, uh, I've got a web page design class, I've got a, a game design class. Um, Very cool. Got, I When I went to schools, like computers were like this brand new thing in uh-huh. schools. It was like... A, a lot of schools didn't even quite have them yet, or if they had, they had only a few. Right. And I was lucky to have teachers that sort of nurtured my, oh, this kid's interested in the computers. We'll sit him in front of the computers and let him do whatever. And I just sort of like self-taught. And now it's like there's there's you know so much more. And well, yeah, because yeah, now one of my classes, like the entire premise is, computers are everywhere. They surround us at all times. We mm-hmm. can't get away from them. What do you need to know? To right. live in this world effectively. Uh-huh. Well, I'm I'm was very thrilled to hear you say that game design is actually one of the things you've mm-hmm. done because I've thought for a long time that that is a really great uh, kind of tool at, because games incorporate so many different skill sets. Yeah. So yeah. as a, as a tool to kind of teach collaborative uh, work, uh-huh. where you can bring together a bunch of students who all have different interests and different skills and say, oh, your your music is your thing, or or mm-hmm. you're into the storytelling part of it, or art, or whatever, and. Yeah. Uh, there's so many different things you can bring in that everyone can have their part of it, and yet they can see how they all contribute to making this thing. So uh, that is really awesome. Uh, I've thought about if I, at some point, uh, was to go do something as a like work in schools, some sort of volunteer work or something, that I would put together sort of a um, uh, extracurricular game design class that mm-hmm. kids could get into. Because I haven't actually seen that done in any of the schools around where we're at. I've, there's computer classes, but I've never seen anyone take the idea idea of incorporating games that seriously. Then I talked to Thad about podcast indexing, uh, which led into a demonstration of a voice-controlled game that he is working on. That's, that's one of the things about podcasts, though, is that, like, indexing is a really, really tough problem. Mm. Um, because, like, you can say whatever you want in the audio file, but unless you have, like, a transcript of the whole thing... Ah. Search engines aren't going to know what's in it. That's an interesting engineering challenge. I wonder if, like, Google's uh, voice recognition is getting better. Yeah. But it's like, it's like could it's someone could someone make a search engine? Okay, I'm patenting this now. This is gonna I'm gonna do this. This will be the thing that makes me rich. Uh, have a, a really strong voice recognition that goes and downloads podcasts, translates them to text, and makes a search index. Yeah. And. Uh, yeah, I mean, if, if anybody's in a good position to do that, it is Google, because yeah. they have the data from YouTube videos, you know, they've been working sure. on automatic transcriptions of those. Mm-hmm. Um, they do have podcasts on Google Play Music now, sure. um, even if it's kind of like pushed back on the fringe, it's, it's there, they <laughs> yeah. have the data. Um, but yeah, that, that's, that's one of the things that I've been kind of wondering in the back of my mind, but I haven't had time to look into, is like... Do MP3 files have support for, like, closed captioning or something like yeah, that? Yeah, that's an interesting that, thought. That's a big accessibility thing. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a... I mean, because there is some metadata that's in an MP3, but I don't right. know if they... Um, yeah, I haven't seen any fields. Most of the metadata fields that I've seen are just, like, uh, author... You know, genre, whatever, yeah. you know. And uh-huh. then, like, maybe 
comment. Yeah. That's supposed to be like, you know, 120 characters or whatever. Sure, sure. Huh. That, 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 you've got my brain thinking now. It's like, how do you <laughs> deal with these accessibility? Because I mean, that's something we, uh, we've kind of dealt with where uh, we've actually worked with the Google Voice API. Okay. Uh, and we, one of our projects, it's kind of on the back burner now. Google we've, Voice being like uh, the, the phone number? Uh, well, no, no, the, the, um, the, it's their voice recognition. It's their stuff okay. that's like integrated into the web where you can just talk and it'll like whatever, <laughs> uh, like right in a browser. Right. And um, that's actually an open API. If you wanted to have uh, voice recognition incorporated into your web page, it's real easy to use their, mm -hmm. their, their uh, voice recognition API, or actually probably call it speech recognition, I think is what they call it. But, um, so it'd be, it'd be crazy to just like take that and uh, plug in, you know, like a, a podcast episode that I finished editing, like have it play mm -hmm. into the computer as as if this was a microphone. And uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, you could could conceivably, I can imagine writing something that basically just because it doesn't know, it's just you're just getting a, a bite of audio basically, mm -hmm. and and uh, you you could basically turn and use their engine. Yeah. And actually what we've done is we've incorporated that into a video game, a web-based video game mm. that uses JavaScript. It uses the phaser library to do this really nice sprite animation. And it's got, um, basically it's a dungeon crawler. Uh, okay. And it's, we've, got a, we've only got a proof of concept. It's very simple. There's three rooms. You've got a little floating ball that moves between them. But you can use your voice to order this thing around. Uh -huh. You can tell it to you know, move about the, the, these rooms. Um, and the idea was we'd make this in, this full... Uh, you know, dungeon crawler, you know, kill the monsters, mm -hmm. find the magic spells, do all that kind of stuff, uh, that you could play completely with your voice. So right. if you've got limited mobility, you can actually do that. And we did a Kickstarter, but it was before we kind of understood the whole idea of uh, you kind of need a following. You need to have people right. that, if, if you're going to pitch you a Kickstarter, need attention. You, need, you already need to have this group of people yeah. that like what you do and say, oh, by the way, now give us money. Uh, and so we... we I think did a great job in putting together our presentation, but then we didn't have anyone to really show it to, other than you know a very small pool. So, so yeah, so that's, so that that's I thought that was, and I don't think anyone else is doing it. I don't think anyone has looked at the the Google Voice API um, and said you could use that in video games. So, so the, the closest thing that I have uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. to that is um, this game called Codename Sickness, Latin for Swan. Um, okay, and uh, its format is like a an audio drama. Mm -hmm. um, that you talk back to, so it's it's like a combination oh. of a choose your own adventure game sure. and uh, an audio drama. Okay. Um, so it's yeah, you're not going to be like moving a sprite around on, sure. on uh, a screen. Um, the intention is like you you can start up the game, mm -hmm. you know, lock your phone, put it in your pocket, and you're listening to it. And sure. Then, you know, responding. Yeah. Well, that's a very yeah, that's a very cool concept. You know, I just realized I have my laptop. I could show you. Oh, what yeah. our words of power game looks like, which it is because it is as much as it's sort of on the back burner right now. It's it's is something we still are interested in working on at some point. Let me get this out. Yeah, the hard part is plugging in the audio recognition. Mm -hmm. So now now that we're looking at something that's both uh, voice and visual uh, components, I get to test out my like NPR style description, oh, description skills, yeah, so right? <laughs> Uh, so we put it out there kind of as a little public demo so people could actually then uh, this kind of would help us develop it as well as, as people are using it uh, we can see what how the voice uh, uh, recognition is working mm -hmm. um, and sort of fine tune it uh, right. because sometimes we can make some logical guesses of well there's only a limited number of commands in the game so if we mm -hmm. see something that sounds kind of similar we know what they probably right. need to do and yeah it's like got to load all the sprites so and of course you'd have to do that kind of adjustment after the Google speech recognition API gives you back what a it big, thinks a the, big the sample. Text. Right, yeah. Right. Okay. So that's why we kind of have, uh, we've got this thing here where they, um, and this was kind of another, uh, this was partially to help us, but also partially help engage the people. Mm -hmm. So they can say, well, I mean, we're actually helping develop the game. Is right. They're going and they're playing around with it, and then there's building up this debug log, and then they can hit this debug, submit debug log, and then we, mm -hmm. we've got this chunk of chunk of information and that's nice so. that, that that makes it optional so that people don't feel like like yeah. you're you're watching their every move while they're mm -hmm. on your website yeah and uh I, if i what i really need to do is make this so that as it's loading the sprites it gives us some sort of little progress indicator because mm -hmm. i could see something like this chasing some people away where they're like oh yeah it's uh must be broken i don't see anything so, but if you're, not, if you're even on I a blame halfway, it on flash yeah, you know, it's, yeah it's, well it's actually it's all javascript that's the right. thing is it's all but, html but when i see like yeah. a black a black rectangle on the screen it's like okay flash motion crashed i gotta so. come back later so this is words of power game dot com i'm gonna go to the voice demo 
while that's loading, we can show you on the other one at least basically how it looks as far as you got this little guy can move around. Mm -hmm. And you can go from room to room. And then, yeah, and you've got, um, what is it? Oh, there we go. You've got the scroll thing here where the, mm -hmm. you have your spell scroll that you can open and close. So we put a little bit of, you know, fun, almost steampunkish kind of. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's the it. gear. Yeah. Oh, and, and what I should do is um, go full screen because then it's a little more fun to see it also. So we're using the keys on the keyboard right now. Mm -hmm. uh, but if, you know, assuming we were in Chrome and, you know, we clicked on the microphone, would it right. continue to accept keyboard input? Yeah, it'll, okay. it'll do both. At least uh, for the demo. Right. Yeah. yeah. Because now you can see it recognizes that the it's got the voice API. Mm -hmm. um, it's, the nice thing is is this same API is now being made accessible on other uh, browsers. I think Mac has incorporated it in, uh, into theirs. Uh, oh, so that was a Opera has it, and, and Firefox is in development. At least it is mm -hmm. last time I looked. So, so that was on Google's end that right. the restriction comes from. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, let's go full screen on this one again, and then I can make sure I and then if I can do this. Go west. I think we're going to have to click allow first. Oops. Oh, you're right. There we go. Go west. Hey, it moved. Yeah. <laughs> go west. Go south. Close spells. And there goes the scroll. <laughs> go west. Open spells. Oh, okay. So this this right here is a faint image of a of a wall that's right. here. Okay, right. So we can't really go any farther south. Yeah. So, yeah. If I go, go south. <laughs> go south. Yeah, it's probably it's like we were speaking before. It was probably bumped up against what we oh, were saying. Sure, sure. So it was yeah. like that's what, it's it's the funny thing is now if we go actually look at the transcript. Um, is you're going to find that, like, well, it's going to caught a bunch of our conversation. <laughs> <laughs> so that's kind of fun. But this is actually then part of the challenge um, is can you sort through some of the background mm -hmm. things that it might pick mm -hmm. up? Because the voice API is actually often uh, catching a lot of that kind of thing. Uh, and how can you make it a l beyond just leveraging the voice API? There's a kind of a lever level of API in interpreting all the text that you get back. Mm -hmm. And that, that's some of the development that we felt we had to do to really turn it into a proper game, as well as make lots of monsters and wizards and, mm -hmm. and various other things like that. And, so. like, even from a less of a technical standpoint um, and more of a gameplay standpoint, you have to think about, like, since this is an entirely new control scheme that hasn't been explored mm -hmm. in games before, like, you know, you said go west, and it went, you know, like five feet to the west. Sure. And then we had to say it again, like, mm -hmm. what's, what are best practices here sure. for this kind of thing? Yeah, there's going to be what you don't want to get in the way of the, the enjoyment of the game mm -hmm. uh, by having them having to do too much yeah. as far as you know micromanage the character or whatever. I mean, right now I basically got it into a, like a three by three grid, right? Uh, and so there's not a whole lot of places you can be mm -hmm. uh, in the map. Um, and but there's like I'm there's probably a lot of things you could do where you can like well you know you're always going to want to do this particular type of task once they enter something so rather than then forcing them to use certain commands you might want to have the game actually automatically do certain right things. so mm -hmm. uh, i thought about putting a run command in there where it'll just basically keep going multiple things mm -hmm. uh multiple steps so you don't have to do three steps at a time to get across your room uh little things like that or some of the gameplay stuff i think we'd have to probably work out this might work really well for like a like just a chess game mm. yeah because you already have you know knight to E3 or sure, whatever, you sure. know? Well, um, yeah, and, and that's and that's the funny thing is, is like, we, you've got this API, anyone can use it. Mm -hmm. I haven't really seen anyone taking advantage of it. Uh, as far as I know, at the time that we came up with this, we were the only people that were thinking about, let's apply the Google Voice API to a game. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, we thought we might actually get a, a, a little more attention just based on that. Right. Uh, but again, it's like you've got all sorts of other people doing clever things, and yeah. you know, you have to try and get The world noticed. is just too darn clever. <laughs> Isn't it? Next, I talked to Matt Letter about the Renaissance Festival, uh, which he actually has a podcast about as well. That's, uh, that's one of my main um, areas of passion, is how do you incorporate technology into art? There you go. So podcasting is a perfect intersection of that mm -hmm. for me. So, Excellent.
That sounds like a fun thing. And the name of it is... Um, the Extra Dimension. Extra Dimension. Yep, on the Nexus.tv. <sighs> You're going to add another podcast to my <laughs> list, am. aren't you? <laughs> I'm so sorry. You're not. You're not sorry at all. <laughs> you are not. I can tell. Uh, awesome. I will trade you a podcast if you want. I I, guess. I also do a podcast. It's actually the Renaissance Festival podcast. Now I got to remember how to spell Renaissance. R E N A I. A I. Uh, there I, it is. Yeah. And that's a very specific one, so it might not be your cup of tea, but it's talking to um, musicians. It's, it's a music-based podcast primarily. Yeah. By minions? Yeah. Okay. I'm one of the minions. There we go. Is that like uh, your improv group or is that... No, it's it's just kind of the... Um, it ended up just being the name for the people that started working on it because we okay. like started acquiring people very quickly and it's like, all right, we're the minions now. It just happened. Um, it's It's got a... Uh, it's, Still in the process of evolving, but it's a lot of um, Renaissance music and musicians. Okay. Um, and my portion of it that I usually bring to it is, um, besides co-hosting sometimes, is the uh, I love doing the interviews with people who are performers and artists and crafters and stuff like that. So people who are actually out doing street performance okay. or who are stage performers who are trying to make a living running around um, singing all day in the dust for people who are like dressed up in all costumes and, and oh, it's, it's so much fun. There's a whole lot of heart and passion into that particular thing. So um, like I said, it's pretty specific, but... Uh, it's a lot of fun. But there's like, there's no place quite like the Renaissance Festival. No. So. <laughs> it is a very unique theatrical experience. You yeah. have an entire village, mm -hmm. several hundred people who are all inhabiting characters for days at a time. And they have their own families and they have their own interactions with each other and the audience and this huge long form improv. And the whole village becomes a stage. And that is pretty much unique to Renaissance festivals, yeah. like a unique style of theater in the world. So The, the closest thing I can think of is uh, when I was working at a Cub Scout camp yeah. you know, for seven years. And, um, you know, we all have camp names. And for six years of that, I didn't, like, know most of my colleagues' real names outside of camp. Um, and you know, yeah, we 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 inhabit those personas because like I obviously act different at camp than outside of camp. Yeah. For you know six days of the week. Oh, totally. And, yeah. <laughs> so you get kind of the thing too, uh -huh. where you know you have, you know, like maybe seventy five percent of them work in technology or you know IT or whatever, and then they'll come and you know put on a fancy outfit and dress up as a courtier. Yeah. And you would never know that <laughs> until you start talking to them. So that's that's really cool. I actually um, there's another close thing to it, which is uh, kind of like the reenactment places where people are saying, "Okay, this is who I am. This is a part of you know, I am cooking stew right now, and I do this because in, in this time period, you know, this is how you did that thing, which is very cool, and I love that." Um, that's more of an information-based right. thing. You're trying to educate people about this specific piece of time or this specific location, what happened here, which is wonderful. Um, the thing that I, I really enjoy about Renaissance Festival specifically is that it's more the interaction. Yeah. The audience is part of this place. You're not educating them about the Renaissance necessarily. You can be doing that. But what you're educating them about is yourself themselves and like the story that's happening that you're both collaborating on together yeah. which is so cool yeah and like a lot of the audience who comes also no, dresses up like, and you know gets yes. into it and everything and, yes um, I think my, the first time that I ever went to the Renaissance Festival uh, like right after we got in the gates some dude pretty sure you know he wasn't actually working there he just comes up with like 
a guitar and starts like singing songs about me and I'm like this guy yeah that's fantastic <laughs> cool. I have my own theme song now yeah. <laughs> what so yeah you can't get that anywhere else that's just that's just fantastic uh, oh I love it which uh, Renaissance festival did you go to uh, the one wait there's multiple <laughs> oh yeah are, are you based locally yeah so you went to Minnesota yeah awesome do you remember what the guy looked like by any chance? Oh, no, he was, I don't know. <laughs> okay, was this a long time ago? Or? No, this was last year. Um, he, I don't know, he was white. I think he was like a teenager. Okay. Um, that's about all I can tell you. Like, I probably know him, which is why I'm asking. <laughs> that's funny. Like, which person, which guitarist? <laughs> all right. And it might not have been a guitar. It might have been smaller than a guitar, but I'm not very Like good. a ukulele kind of thing? Maybe. I don't remember exactly. Oh, I bet I know actually who it was. <laughs> Oh, I bet I know which group they were a part of. It was probably one of the Sky Vault kids. Oh, possibly. Was there, like, a lot of them? Uh, no, he was just by himself. Just by himself? That, okay, yeah. it might have been Jacob then, too. Yeah, I did see the Sky Vault kids a few weekends ago when we went to see the Danger Committee. Yeah. And, uh, and they were, this was, like, the last show of the day for them, and, uh, and the Sky Vault kids were, like, up behind the stage and then, you know, got to come down and... Uh, do their like ladder pose oh, no. while the danger committee juggled stuff around them. Oh my gosh! <laughs> Though that group is so amazing. They're based in Rochester, mm -hmm. and they are a force of nature. I came and saw them here in Minneapolis as well last December. Oh yeah, yeah. for one of their uh, was I, it for the Fringe? I think it was their Christmas show. Christmas show. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, it was yeah it was Star Wars and Christmas themed. Yep. Excellent. <laughs> Oh, I love that group to death. They're so much fun. So, they they bring a lot of energy to those to interactions. I can tell you that. Oh, and I love like seeing them in multiple different places because they like they make fun of the different venues that they're at, you know, and how the 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 crowd is slightly different and the you know the way that they act on stage is slightly different and everything. And, Absolutely. Yeah. And they are, they give me hope for the future too, because a lot of the Renaissance festivals are kind of slowly, uh, and I don't want to say, no, n not necessarily, but they had, they had a Renaissance. Uh, I mean, they started in the 60s and 70s, and there are still performers, there are still a lot of performers who have been doing it since then. And... They are starting to retire. They're starting to get at the point where they're having kids or they've had kids for a long time and they want to settle down. And so to see young, talented actors come in and start taking in those roles and start learning from those things. And, um, and so you're talking about that. Sky Vault. I'm talking about Sky Vault specifically. Okay. But also, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of um, actors like Sky Vault who are trying new things, who are getting out there and, and doing that. And I think one of the one of the functions that Renaissance festivals bring is allowing people to forget all the problems of the world and have a story that they can be a part of to whatever extent that is. If they want to make their own story, they come with their groups and I'm the wizard and I'm the, you know, <laughs> I'm the fighter or whatever and they go and they, they watch Danger Committee or whatever, but they'll, they'll, they'll do those things. And, but when they, when they talk to people, they have that opportunity to just inhabit a person for a day. Uh -huh. You know, and I love that there are these new actors coming in and helping support that and helping but then even if you don't want to get into it like that oh that yeah level you, you know you still come you totally well yeah come, show up eat a turkey fun. leg enjoy the shows uh -huh. you know and that and and watch some amazing talented people do things that you will never see anywhere else where else will you go and watch a bunch of guys throw knives past a group of kids on a ladder mm -hmm. <laughs> that are on fire or or tasers at each other or watch um, and then go and uh, watch a couple of guys in tights like talk about fart jokes. For, yeah, for you know, 40 minutes. yeah, yeah. <laughs> or watch watch a live joust or watch yeah. you know, um, watch somebody make 
an, an improvised scene right then and there that'll never happen again. It's it's really really cool to me um, because of that, and a lot of improv too will have your characters will change from scene to scene. You're you know every thirty seconds you could be somebody different, um, but with these with this actual village of people, and they all know each other and they all have relations to each other in various ways. There's a huge story a huge amount of reality to this mm -hmm. that you can be a part of too. Yeah. Oh, oh. <laughs> Sorry, I, I, I geek out over this stuff because it's... That's good, that's good. Yeah. No, I should not apologize for geeking out about something that I'm really passionate about. It is amazing and it's unique. And I love it. So I'm very glad that you were able to um, to visit. What were your favorite parts? Um, I'm, yeah, I'm most attracted to the, the stage performances. Um, my fiance comes for like the you know the art show aspect of it, going around and looking at all the crafts. Oh yeah. And, yeah. Um, so I think we've got uh, at least a couple of like household items now that, that came from the Renaissance Festival. Oh, they started accumulating really yeah. fast. <laughs> if you're not careful. <laughs> and that's that's one of the things about like um, you know here a lot of the creators are talking about like you know what kind of merchandising and stuff can you do and whatnot. And it's like. Well, I don't want merchandise from all of the different things that I listen to and watch and stuff. Can I just give you some money, please? And, like, you use that to keep making stuff. I don't fill up my house with a bunch of crap that I don't actually need. And we're all happy. Yeah, you, you, they, they put out a hat. You can put a dollar in. You can put five dollars in. And then you feel good. Yeah. You don't need to buy the T-shirt if you don't want to. Exactly. Um, oh, you know what was the coolest thing that I saw this year was... Um, that group that was doing like Viking covers of uh, of like pop songs. Starioska. Maybe. Was they they from Belarus? Uh, yeah. I, yeah. The ocean. You were <laughs> lucky to see them. They were only there two weekends. Okay. Um, and they were only going to be there one weekend, but they came back because they had so much fun. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, that is a very cool group. We were lucky to have them this year. And yeah, we, yeah. I mean, we just kind of stumbled upon them uh, as they were playing. We had just gotten some uh, Euros from, you know, a food stand, and, and we're like, where can we go and eat this? Oh, look, there's some music going on up there. Let's check that out. And it's, it, I think they make their own instruments, too, and they're like... Yeah, maybe, yeah. Ah, oh, that's <laughs> awesome. So, you, you, like, the high energy and the... Mm -hmm. Very cool. And just like, and just the the weirdness of it, right? Like you've never seen anything like that before. Yeah. Here's some medieval <laughs> instruments playing Metallica. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> All right. You know, it's like the Sky Vault Kids. Here's um, they're they're making up songs uh, with Shakespearean sonnets. They're 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 doing all this stuff. <laughs> you can talk with it. They had puppets there. Speaking of puppets, they have uh, they have Felton. Okay. Um, there's a. There's a lot of really cool secret stuff going on there that are, I mean, the more you explore, the more time. You can't see <laughs> it all. Got to come back a few times. Absolutely. A few years. <laughs> Absolutely. Definitely do it next time. Next, I talked to Tyler Zobel, who is very, very enthusiastic about podcasts. He, we took a t deep dive into some of the podcasts that he's interested in, and we also talked about the podcasts that he makes about the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Yeah, I started with Night Vale because I had heard about it and it sounded funny and then I watched, listened to it and I was like, wow, this is cool. And then I actually got my first apartment alone. I had a roommate for a while and I got my first apartment alone and that's when I started listening to like a ton of podcasts. So I was like, wow, it's kind of quiet in here. So I just started listening to stuff uh, while I was like moving in. And then through that... Uh, through, are those the ones you follow? These are all of the podcasts. Nice. <laughs> Honestly, see, I gotta see if I recognize any of these. Till death was blight. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, the McElroys. How could I forget? I them? sinking love the McElroys. I just recently discovered them, and I love them to death. But uh, anyway, after, it was either because of the crossover or because they mentioned it. I started listening to Thrilling Adventure Hour, uh -huh. and then I got obsessed with Paul F. Tompkins. Okay. So I just listened to everything. <laughs> uh, everything Paul F. Tompkins. Uh, I love Spontaneous Nation. Okay. With Paul F. Tompkins. I love. Uh, well, then through Paul F. Tompkins, I found Super Ego. 
And then through Super Ego, I found Matt Gorley. And through Matt Gorley, I started listening to <laughs> Pistol Shrimps Radio, which I stinking love. Okay. I'm wearing a Pistol Shrimps Radio t-shirt, if you're listening. Um, <laughs> does it have anything to do with basketball? Yes, it does. Okay. Oh, are you not aware? I don't know Pistol Shrimps. Are you aware of Super Ego? Uh, I, I know... I remember that they had a couple of like crossover episodes on, or like collaborative episodes. It's very on, weird. Like, hour. Yeah, yeah. Well, those guys it's, are everywhere. It you, called, it, what's they, weird? They do like scripted improv, right? Or something like that. Semi-scripted. Okay. It's improv, but then they edited a lot afterwards and had okay. sound effects and stuff. Okay. Um, okay. So for, it should be said, uh, I think it's four guys. One guy's name I forget. <laughs> <laughs> this is a good start. On Twitter, he's Shunt McGuppin, which is one of his characters. Whatever. Okay. okay. I, I should say this first. There is this cloud of, like, L.A. comedy people that all get into the same shenanigans. And if you watch the cartoon Adventure Time, they all do guest voices on there. Okay. Which is one reason that cartoon's amazing. Okay. But, um, and a lot of them are from these podcasts. Uh, Paul F. Tompkins came in later. It started with this one dude who's Shunt McGuppin on Twitter, whose name I forget. Um... Uh, Mark McConville, who's actually from, like, Wisconsin and Minnesota. Okay. I don't know where he's from, but he, like... Has Minnesota references uh, sometimes. Uh, Matt Gorley, who's like an improv genius and an idiot and amazing. Uh, and then Paul F. Tompkins guested a few times, and then he just like became part of the group. Now all their podcasts, I think you have to buy them, huh. or okay. they're through Earwolf, so I think you have to like subscribe to the Earwolf okay. network or okay. something like that. Yeah. Um, and I found out about Earwolf uh, for when they mentioned that for um, improv Scott Star Trek, right? Yeah. They have. I'm aware of them because they are blanketing over a lot of major podcasts, especially Paul F. Tompkins okay. ones. And Paul F. Tompkins, do you know who that is? Yeah. Yeah. Um, He's uh, yeah. Frank Doyle. Yep. yep. And amongst other people. Um, but they're all improv guys. That's like a lot of the big stuff they do, but they're like really good at it. Um, but uh, uh, Mark McConville and Matt Gorley started um, uh, live announcing these basketball games and this the, the team is the pistol shrimps and the pistol shrimps has an interesting history and if you okay CISO is another thing that all these improv podcasts are that's one of the ads they have is CISO it's like Netflix for comedy okay. um, it's just a channel you pay like five bucks a month anyway I'm not so gonna this is a real ad not like a fake ad it's a real ad for a internet thing called CISO anyway there's shows on those comedy whatever I don't want to put an ad for CISO necessarily on a thing unless they want to pay you um but they, their a Pistol Shrimps documentary is on there about it. So if you're actually really interested, okay. go watch it. But um, it's a team. Aubrey Plaza is like the poster child for it from like Parks and Rec, the actress. Okay. But she doesn't even play for them anymore. Um, but she <laughs> is like the face because she's like the most famous person on there. She went on like Jimmy Fallon and talked about it. Okay. All these L.A. comedians and comedy writers and writers and like TV show creators and stuff all these ladies in LA they wanted to create they just got I don't know they just decided to create a like a basketball league so they did okay. uh, it's the LA Municipal Basketball League and it's women's basketball <laughs> and they have a, they have enough people that they have a bunch of teams and they it's a league it's a genuine basketball <laughs> league it's not professional it's just uh, it's just all these people who are like this weird network right. and so they started playing these games in like public gymnasiums and school gyms and stuff and then Matt Gorley, his uh, now fiance, is on the Pistol Shrimps. Okay. So he and got Mark McCollumville, and they're like, we don't know anything about sports. Matt Gorley knows nothing <laughs> about sports. And, like, Mark McConville played, like, basketball in, like, kid, like first grade or something. Okay. Or, like, maybe high school. So he knows a bit. But they're both just, like, improv weirdos. So they are in, like, this noisy gyms, and they bring their cruddy microphones, and they're, like, sitting in the corner, and sometimes the ball flies off the court and hits them. And they just half discuss what the game is about, like, what's going on live, and they're also just talking about, like, nonsense stuff. Um, I gotta say, this is the <laughs> deepest cut that I've gotten this weekend. Of, what do you like, mean? Like, just, like, it's, like... This is, like, my favorite podcast. Like, anytime it comes out, it's the first one I have to listen to. <laughs> There's so much background information There's that you so had much. to give me before, like, really getting into what I also I get ranty. This should be, like, <laughs> I don't stop if I start. That's okay. I ended up. <laughs> oh, well, we'll have fun with that. Yeah. Anyway, it's a great podcast. The Pistol Shrimps Radio. It's really, really funny. <laughs> An example of a thing is that they started getting, like, fan mail and stuff. And because Matt Gorley likes to mess with Mark, he just started asking... They, they, at first they were like, guys, there's a charity that's connected to this. So they were like, if you don't, you, 
we like to, you, when you send us stuff, but please send to this charity, which is okay. lovely. Um, but Matt or uh, Matt Gorley likes to mess with Mark, so he's like, guys, send us an anvil. I want a full size anvil because Mark has to go to the PO box and pick it up. So it has been this on running gag of people sending like tiny, like twenty pound anvils. <laughs> Or just like random stuff that has the title Anvil. It's very, it's very strange. Uh, it's a great podcast, though, if you like improv and just weird, very weird stuff. So I, I got to admit, um, part of the, the whole point of going to the podcast-related um, uh, panels for me was, A, hearing that... Shield, nice. Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm also... My stupid podcast I have with my one friend is just us talking about Marvel stuff. Okay. Um, <laughs> Mostly Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. So, uh, mm. yeah, it was, was like listening to what they had to say about like advice and whatnot for, yeah. for podcasters and stuff. But was also, uh, the other point was getting a list of like podcasts that I need to check out. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Pistol Shrimps Radio is the one. Oh, uh, I already had it written down. Yeah, because oh, um, uh, Ben Acker. Mentioned it during. Yeah, he did. One, and yeah, I was okay. the only person whistling about it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I'm wearing that shirt tomorrow. <laughs> Uh, That's awesome. Yeah. I was very happy that he mentioned it. Um, do you want to add any of like your podcasts to my list? I don't know what you know. Uh, Spontaneous Nation with well, Paul no, F. No, Tompkins. What I, what I mean is the ones that you make. Oh, I, I just have the one. What's, what's it called? Um, it's, not on Netflix, it's not on iTunes yet. It's only on SoundCloud. It's okay. called um, The Raft, an MCU podcast. The Raft named after the prison where all the super villains go. In Marvel, have they, wait, have they, it's in the movies. In the in Civil War, it's the thing that rises oh, out of sure, the ocean. Sure. Okay. Yeah, yeah. In the comics, I think it's an island. It's not in the ocean. But at first, okay. we called it the Coulson Cast. But then there's already a podcast called that. Yeah. <laughs> so I was like, hmm, what's a thing that no one has used yet? And I found that. So yeah, it's okay. We we started with them season four of Agents of Shield. Okay. We've been doing every episode. Those episodes come out on Tuesday, and then our episode talking about it comes out the next day on Wednesday, like nice. at night. By the time we've recorded it and That's I've edited cool. it, yeah. Yeah. and then we did uh, three episodes covering all of Luke Cage. Those are longer okay. and slower. The other ones are trying to like get fast. The uh-huh. Luke Cage got a little meandery, but I haven't uh, gotten around to watching Luke Cage yet. I liked it. But, it was good. Okay. I was in Daredevil cosplay yesterday, <laughs> which is why my knuckles look like I beat someone to death. Okay. I didn't. I, I was uh, yeah, avoiding asking about no, that. No, I went to Chipotle, and the woman was like, she took my card, and then she was like, what happened to your knuckles? And I was like, oh, no. Uh, no, 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 I didn't. And this was at, like, 10 o'clock at night. And I was like, no, I'm in costume. Don't worry. I didn't beat someone up. Got it. Got it. Yeah. That was fun. <laughs> And to finish off this episode, I talked to Liz Noterman, who uh, talked a lot about some of the video games that she likes, uh, some theories about uh, TV shows and what what networks can do to grow the audiences of their TV shows and stuff like that. I don't have an Xbox, but three of my four brothers do. And my favorite game to play on that is um, Fable 2. It does, yes. That's the third one. Okay. I didn't like the third one. I felt like the third one um, restricted my gameplay options too much because, like, it pushed the story along more than what I wanted. Because, like, with Fable Two, you could go and do your excursions, your little missions, whatever, and, like, you could go at your own pace, except for there was one mission that you had to do, um, and once you did that, you couldn't go back and do stuff before it, because that that mission in the middle takes, like, 10 years or whatever within the game to complete, so, um, yes, but it's all about morality, so you get to decide, basically, it starts when you're a child, um, this ruler of the town is looking for people with heroes blood um, because they're the only kind of people who could take them down and they kill your older Uh, he kills your older sister except for it's a guy Um, and he kills your older sister because 
he thinks like that is the hero, but it ends up being you, and you can play as either a male or a female. And so you decide like the role of the game is basically to like get through to the point where you can like defeat him, but along the way you decide if you want to take the path of good or the path of evil. Right. right? So you're gonna defeat him either way, but for different reasons. Yes. So it's like either it's either vengeance or to free everybody else, basically. Okay? And so, like, everything you do, like, eating meat, for instance, makes you, in the, within the game, it lowers your goodness points. Just, just the meat, eating meat. Um, like, there was one time when I was going through the woods, and it's, an icon came to say, like, pick something up. So I picked it up, and I found out it was the money bag of these people who were getting robbed, but I didn't know that. So my morality went down because I accidentally stole from people. And you can't give it back. No. Because that wasn't built into the game. Yes. And, and like, and okay, so I have such a guilty conscience. Like, that tormented me until, <laughs> like, this is really bad. It's a, it's a game. Um, I told you that you go on that, like, the 10-year journey. Uh-huh. Um, if you are on the side of light, you have to do this one mission before you go on it to save this holy well. Okay, because the dark people are trying to take it over because it's going to snuff out the light in the area. So if you don't go and save it, when you get back, the town that this well of goodness is outside of is completely decimated. And I forgot to do that once. Yeah, so every time I went through that town, I just felt horrific. <laughs> Even in the playthroughs where you did remember? You uh, just that one game. Oh, okay. um, because I tried to play through it and sometimes you have to pass through the town I just felt so bad so I, I stopped I deleted it and started over because mm-hmm. I couldn't handle that I didn't save this town and it's a freaking video game so whatever my mom did to raise me I think she did okay yeah, I, I played through like the Mass Effect series several times because it okay. has yeah morality and like mm-hmm. character consequences you know if you say yep. like the wrong thing to the wrong person and, okay um, yeah like the first time that I played through was like me kind of making the choices that I thought I would have. But mm-hmm. then like once I got to the end, I was like, well, I don't feel like the writers were informing me about the, like all of the background to this choice. Yeah. And like, you know, I feel like my character would have known more. So I went back and did it again. Yeah. But I also knew the consequences more. So yeah. I was like, you know, kind of yeah. gaming the system there. Well, it's all... I kind of think a game is really only good if you want to go back and play it again. Okay, yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, because if you buy a game and then, like, you finish it and you put it on the shelf and you never play it again, like, I kind of feel like it's like a book, you know? A really good book you want to pick up and read again. Right. A really good video game you want to pick up and play again. And that's actually, that's why I've become more attracted to, like, shorter two to six hour, like, video okay. games. Where it's like, okay... I can sit down and do this in an evening. Okay. Right? You know, if I want to yeah. spend a, a movie length amount of time, mm-hmm. and then uh, and then you know let it sit for you know six months, a year, whatever, and then I'll go back to it again. And yeah. Experience it again. Yeah. It's really hard to do that with like a sixty-hour game. Yes. <laughs> yes, I know. Um, I'm. I started playing Zelda, um, Shadow Princess, mm-hmm. and. I have actually started the game twice because the first time um, I had like the last leg of the journey, but I had to set it aside because there was stuff I had to just get done in the other parts of my life. Mm-hmm. So then when I wanted to go and play it again, I'm like, I don't remember what I'm supposed to do. Right. <laughs> like, yeah. I, how do I fight again? Which sounds really stupid. Anyway, so I started playing it again. So I'm basically at the exact same spot again <laughs> where I left up the first time. You're not going to stop this time, right? I'm going to finish I, it. I have stopped, but it's only been a couple of weeks as okay. opposed to like two or three years. Uh-huh. So, yeah. There's still time. <laughs> There's still time. I won't forget in the meantime, I promise. But Now, what I found interesting was um, a little while back, I think it was NBC, released a report on a, this great, um, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on the word, um, research study study that they had done about why people don't watch new tv shows Hmm. 
and the conclusion that they came up with was people like to watch them from the beginning and if you don't offer those beginning shows they won't watch it mm -hmm. I'm like you had to do a study to tell you that <laughs> I'm like why do you think Netflix is popular <laughs> oh, pretty much so yeah so then like I think CW I, I think this is true I haven't checked it out I think they now have like all of their shows just available on their website that you can just watch and that explains why like old show has mm -hmm. like you know a loyal fan base a cult following right mm -hmm. and then it gets on Netflix and then boom like everybody's watching it all of a sudden like Parks and Rec yeah I never watched Parks and Rec until finally enough people said I think you'd really like Parks and Rec and then I mm -hmm. binge watched it on Netflix twice now and I think they, they also cited like that it allows sleeper hits like uh, Breaking Bad which didn't really get a lot of people watching it until really? it's like third season or something like that. Like that's when everybody started talking about it. Okay. But because it was all, all available for everybody to go and catch up, like mm -hmm. that expanded the, the audience very, very quickly. Yes. I think one of the biggest mistakes um, TV stations make currently is that they don't put their seasons, like their previous seasons on Netflix as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. For instance, like I was just talking about the CW, um, I'm really into the DC comic shows on the CW okay. because The Flash is amazing. Um, but they didn't release last season on Netflix uh -huh. until the current season had already started. I'm like, uh, that's too late because uh, you don't let people who missed it be able to catch up before mm -hmm. it starts. Yeah. I need something to do over my summer, right? Right. <laughs> on my weekends when it's cold. Like anything. Yeah. Or at night when I'm cleaning, mm -hmm. like just to have that in the background. But mm -hmm. so I think that's one big mistake that a lot of like I said, TV shows make. And then things get popular after they get cancelled. And it's like, well, it's because you limited it. Like, um, Agent Carter. Yeah. There's a lot of people who love Agent Carter. I didn't get to watch the second season Me because either. I missed the first however many episodes. And that one isn't episodic. You have to watch every episode to get right. the full story. So I couldn't watch it until... Well, I haven't been able to watch it yet because it's not even on Netflix yet. So thanks for listening to The Extra Dimension. I have been your host, Ian R. Buck. You can find me on Twitter at Ian R. Buck or uh, check out my website for other things that I make, ianrbuck.com. Uh, if you want to find links to the guests here and, stu and the stuff that we were talking about, make sure to go and see the show notes at nexus.tv slash TED19. Uh, and while you're there, you could uh, contact us, The Nexus, at the Nexus uh, TV on Twitter uh, or the Nexus TV at gmail.com. Thanks for listening. Have a good one.